Father, once again, we want to thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that you heard each person. You know each person by name. You actually know how many hairs are on the head of each person here. And for some of us, Lord, like myself, you know how long we spend in the mirror trying to comb those hairs this morning. And so, Father, we are trusting you and asking you to give us a word from you today as we conclude this series on encouragement. And so, Father, we ask that you would take this series out with a bang. And today we have to look at some specific things in that area, but we are just trusting you to have your way. I, too, come in agreement with everyone here and ask that we would get a specific word from you, each one of us. And when we leave here today, we know that we've heard from you. And so, Father, we are trusting you, the great I Am. We call on you, Yahweh. And, Father, we know that you're able to do more than we could ever ask or think, and we're trusting you to do that. We acknowledge that this is all about you. It's not about me or anyone else. It's about you. And so we just trust you. We acknowledge again, as we have already sung, you're a good, good Father. And you're good all the time. And so we thank you for that. So, Lord, have your way today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand, we're going to have our scripture readings, and this will be the last time that you will read these scriptures in this context, anyway, of encouragement. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to let you lead out, and then you'll read Philippians 3.10. I'll read 1 Thessalonians 5.11. You'll read the next one, and I'll read the next one. So we're going to go back and forth but we're going to let you start today, okay? So on three, we're going to let you start, and I will follow you, and then we'll just go back and forth. Does everybody understand what we're doing? Okay, and don't forget, if something were to happen and the screen was to go black or, or something else is going to show up on there, you have it in your bulletin. All you have to do is read these in your bulletin. They're on page 11. So on three, one, two, three... Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You may be seated. Thank you. Encouragement part three. For our visitors, we just want to let you know that we started this thing out as by coming to the conclusion that we all need encouragement at some time in our life. As we look at our lives, there's so much going on in each and every person's life, whether they're a single, a single a parent, a family, whatever the case may be, everybody's got drama going on in their lives, and everybody's got trauma. And so everybody needs encouragement. And so we looked at specific areas, whether you're a caregiver, or whether someone has just died in your family, or whether you have relational struggles, or whether you're struggling with whatever it might be, everybody needs encouragement. And so we looked at that and we came to that conclusion. Then we said, okay, what in the world is encouragement? And we have a lot of definitions for it, but we narrowed it down to basically three areas. When I need encouragement, sometimes I need to be strengthened. I need someone to come alongside me and help me be strengthened. Sometimes when I need encouragement, all I need is comfort. I need somebody to go walk with me, speak gently to me, just listen to me right now. I need to be comforted. And then sometimes this word encouragement gets a little bit stiffer. Every once in a while, some of us need a warning. We need a little bit tougher encouragement. We need somebody to come warn us about the path we're getting ready to take. And so as we talked about encouragement, we said the very th first thing that we want to do when we want to encourage someone is we need to look at our relationship with God. We went to Philippians 3.10, and we saw that Paul had been walking with God for 28 years. And he said, the way that you're encouraging people, the way that we can encourage people, is to encourage them to get to know God better, to, to become more intimate, intimate with him, excuse me, to get to know that he really is a good, good father. Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know him more intimately, and I want to just really know the power of his resurrection. Some of us are discouraged because we don't know the power of God. We don't believe the power of God. 
And so if we want to encourage folks, we want to encourage them to know God and to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Having the correct view of suffering, that suffering viewed correctly makes us better people, not only more intimately with God, but even with our fellow man. When we go through suffering and we come out of it the right way, we have a deeper relationship with God and we can encourage people and we have been encouraged. And so we're looking at encouraging people, getting them to be encouraged about their relationship with God, getting to know God deeper, getting to know the power of this thing, getting all that God has brought to the table. The average Christian really does not understand all that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ accomplished for them. And so as we get into this, to be encouraged, we need to understand these things. We need to grow in depth of our relationship with God and depth of relationship of what his word really means and what the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ accomplished. Most Christians can tell you Jesus Christ died for my sins, but most Christians can't tell you that I died with Christ and there are some benefits with that. And so we don't have that peace. And so Paul is saying we need to understand the whole piece there. What does it mean to be being conformed to his death? It's understanding everything that happened at his death, including my co-crucifixion with him. So we need to be encouraged. We need to know those benefits and those blessings that come from what Christ did on the cross, understanding that. And so then we looked at 1 Thessalonians 5.11 and we saw that a lot of people are discouraged because they don't have the right view of things. We have what is called a very temporal perspective instead of an eternal one. I am concerned about what's happening now and I'm not worried about what's happening in the future. My whole concept is what is going on with me right now. Um, it's about the temporary and not the eternal. And so encouragement comes when I have an eternal perspective. I know that one day Christ is coming back for me. I understand that I am a Christian who is already a citizen of heaven. Heaven's my home. I am here as an ambassador in a temporary stay. I'm only going to be here a hundred years if, if, that, that, if I get to get to that. But eternity doesn't even get warmed up at a hundred years. And I'm going to be with God so long they won't be able to count it. And so we need to have a focus of where am I really focusing when I'm discouraged. It's usually because I'm focusing here on the temporal. And we talked about this in detail. And we're not going to go over it again, but that's why we're having so much stress and trauma and drama in our country because the people in our country, including the Christians, are looking at the United States as heaven. And somebody's messing with my heaven. That we're not, the person that I want to run my heaven is not running it. And so we're having all kinds of issues because we're not trying to get to, to heaven. We're not excited about going to heaven. Our heaven's here and we want to make this the very best it can be while we're here. And we're not talking about the unsaved. It is the Christians who are doing that as well. Talk about going to heaven. Oh, I got things to do. I got a luncheon date this afternoon. So we've talked about that. That comes from having the wrong perspective. That comes from focusing on everything that's here and not focusing on what God has said in his word. You are here just in a temporary stay. You know, this is not your home. You know, no matter who the president is, your commander in chief, his name is Yahweh. You see, some of us gotta remember that. That's who our commander in chief is. His name is Yahweh. So some of us need to be encouraged by getting our thinking in order, getting our thinking in order. And so we looked at that. So when we have that perspective, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says we can be encouraging each other and building each other up because that is the right perspective. And so as we get ready to go here, I just want to remind us again that when we have the right perspective about who God is, who we are, how long we're going to be here, where we're from, what is our citizenship, who our commander-in-chief is, we have to understand that God is intending for the church, the body of Christ, to take care of the church, the body of Christ. If you need encouragement, it's supposed to be coming from other Christians. When we gather together, if you need something or you're lacking something, the church, the body of Christ corporately is supposed to be meeting that need. That's where we're having problems too. The president was never called by Yahweh to meet your needs. The president never was called to be God to you. Are, are you seeing what I'm saying? We've got, to, we've got to understand this. The government of the United States and President Obama and President-elect Donald Trump, they make poor gods. They make poor gods. See, there's only one God, but what we've done, we've moved them into God's spot. The government, the president's supposed to take care of me. He's supposed to bring peace in my house. Are you seeing? 
We've got everything all messed up here. They make poor gods. It is the church, the body of Christ, that God is using to meet the needs of the church, the body of Christ. God never said that you need to call President Obama or, or President Donald J. Trump to get encouraged. You're supposed to be able to get your local telephone list and call somebody in the church, the body of Christ, that you belong to. That's where our encouragement is supposed to be coming from. You're not supposed to be tuning in to the old network and even doing all these other things, going, going on television to get some self-help and some self-encouragement and all of that. That is supposed to come from the church, the body of Christ. Amen? But then we got to serve it straight. Is the church the body of Christ being the church the body of Christ? That's how we've got in some of the messes that we're in. If we have been praying over our presidents and our governments and our governors like we're supposed to be, I think some of us would be having a little less stress in our lives anyway. It says you're to pray for those leaders for what reason? So you can have some peace in your life. Amen? And so it was never intended for somebody other than the church, the body of Christ, to encourage the church, the body of Christ. And so we've been looking at these things. And so then last week we got into this in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 that, you know what, we've talked about encouraging each other, strengthening each other, warning each other, comforting each other, but then this thing about the church, the body of Christ, every once in a while the tune-up needs to come in God's house because we're not being the church, the body of Christ, and so therefore God has to tell us how to treat each other so that we can be the church, the body of Christ as we're marching and going into this battle, so to speak. And so we looked last week and he said, you know what, we got to urge you, brethren, that in the church, the body of Christ, there are people that the Bible calls unruly. You know, they're always going to march to their own beat, their own drummer. We're all going this way and they're going another direction. He said, you have to encourage them by going over there, getting them and telling them you need to get in line, straighten up and fly right. Okay, and so we looked at these things last week that we are to encourage other Christians in the church, the body of Christ, who are unruly. Then we saw a group last week called the faint-hearted, you know, and these are people that seem to just really have a struggle. They're, they just can't seem to stick with anything. You know, they, they tend to quit. They seem to be uh, fragile. Um, we had to do a thing, go encourage them until they stop quitting everything, until they start getting some strength in their lives and they can go forward. We're we're supposed to encourage people in the church to body of Christ that way. And then we saw last week that we need to help the weak. And we talked about that. This is a different category. These are Christians who always seem to be struggling and being defeated by sin. It says don't go talk about them. Don't go judge them in a sense. It's saying this. No, you go alongside them and build into their life so that they can sin less and they can be stronger and then they can turn around and build into somebody else's life and make them stronger. This is the church, the body of Christ. This is how we're supposed to encourage each other. Are we seeing this? You can't go to the culture for this kind of encouragement because we're talking about sin. The culture is saying sin is okay. The culture is saying we're going to fight for sin. That's what the culture is saying. You can't be encouraged to sin less from the culture because the culture is saying sin all the more. This is a right. Are you seeing this? And so the church, the body of Christ, has to encourage those who are weak. And then last of all, last week we looked at we need to be patient with everyone. We need to be patient with everyone. Not last all, but just... Last week in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, and I said it this way, on any given day, all of us are a bear to bear with. All of us, including you. You're a bear to bear with some days, and we all need patience. We need somebody to bear with us. I said it this way, I'll say it again. I get up some days, look in the mirror, and get on my own nerves. I said that last week. We're a bear to bear with at any given time, and the church, the body of Christ, is where patience should be exercised. So then we move to Hebrews 3.13, and I'm, I'm about done. We talk about another type of encouragement. We're to continue to encourage people as long as we can still say today. As long as we can still say it today, there is breath in our lungs, we can still say that we can encourage somebody and we can be encouraged. As long as we can still say today. And so he says here, make sure that you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
And we explained that to you folks, and we want to go over that again just real briefly, that how we respond to things is one of two ways. We either open our heart to things, or we close our heart to things. We either open our hearts to people, or we close our hearts to people. And so what sin does, it'll trick you, it'll throw something at you, where you close your heart to things. You close your heart to things. You close your heart to the church, the body of Christ. You close your heart to Christians. You close your heart to the things of God. And here's the big one. And you close your heart to God himself. And it's a choice that we make. And so you want to open your heart. You want to open your heart. We're all good at closing our hearts. We have PhDs in it. You bitter towards somebody, you angry towards somebody, unforgiveness in your heart, health issues that are really soul problems, things going on in your mind, will, and emotions are killing your body. That's probably because you closed your heart somewhere. Are you saying that? Closing your heart hurts you and everybody else around you. And I'm not making light of it. And closing your heart to God can mean spending eternity without him. Without him. We don't want to do that. And how do we get there? Sin deceives us. It deceives us. It makes us think that doing this or being this or whatever it is is going to meet my needs better than God will. This is going to work. This is going to do it for me. Not God. And it deceives us. And it messes us up. We're the church. We're supposed to be going out encouraging folks, grabbing them, loving on them, being the church. Because at any given point, all of us are in this place. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter where you are now, oh, you've closed your heart. You might be sitting here right now with a closed heart. You might have closed your heart yesterday and just opened it back up this morning. You see what I'm saying? Huh? We've all been there. So nobody should feel beat up on it. It's we, us, I. But what are we to do? We're to be the church, the body of Christ. Don't let somebody sit there and be the proverbial frog and boil to death. Go get them out of the, the, out of the fire, out of the water. That's the church, the body of Christ. And quit waiting for the president to do it. Are we getting this? So, we go to new material today. So we're in Hebrews 10, 24, and um, we want to encourage each other by reminding each other of the truth. Encouragement means to strengthen each other, to comfort each other, and to warn each other. And that's what this thing is all about. So we're coming at it a different way. Today we're going to look at something called stimulation as we talk about encouragement. I want you to read Hebrews 10, 24 with me, and I want you to read it out loud with me. At this time, it's very short. Let's read it together. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, 24. Listen to me now. Here's what, what the Bible's saying. We're talking about the church, the body of Christ. God is saying that he wants you to consider each other. And what it means is to be attentive to someone, to uh, check them out, to study them out a little bit. Okay, are you guys following this? Uh, uh, usually a man doesn't seem to have too much problem. I'm sure women don't either, but men especially, you see somebody that you think is attractive and you over there looking and you looking up and down and doing all that kind of stuff. And I know all y'all bounce y'all's eyes. So I'm talking about before, you know, BC, before Christ. I'm talking about before you ever got saved and you, you understand now about bouncing eyes and all that. I, I, know, I know you're not there now, but remember back in the day when you would just look a woman down and you look at her hair and you work herself all the way down to to the bottom of her shoes even, and what kind of shoes did she have on? You're studying her attentively. Is anybody uh, saying that? You might have married that person, you know? Is anybody understanding? I know that you guys don't want to respond because you've never done anything like that, but I'm just talking hypothetically, hypothetically. So you, you've checked her out, and uh, you know, you've done all of that, and you remember that? You studied her attentively? You really looked? You really stared? That's what we're talking about here. Now, what in the world are we, where are we going today, preacher? The Bible is saying today, believe it or not, you're supposed to study people in the church, the body of Christ, attentively like that. Checking them out, looking at them. And we're not talking in that way. 
but we're talking about in another way. You're, you're trying to see where they are spiritually. Okay, you're trying to see where they are spiritually. And so you're not judging anybody, you're not putting them in, in any kind of box, and you're not trying to impose your standards on them, so to speak, but you're trying to look at people in the church, the body of Christ, and study them um, and see where they are. You're, you're trying to see where they really are spiritually, okay? And so um, we've got a different case here in the book of Hebrews, and I'm, I'm going to try to give you life application, because everything I'm saying, is this book here is, is kind of a, an interesting one to deal with. But this particular text is saying that we um, believers should be studying each other, and you're supposed to be doing it continuously. So it's not something you do once a year, but it's something that you keep on doing. And what you're doing is you're taking note of the spiritual welfare of the person sitting next to you, so to speak. So to bring this down where you can grab a hold of it, what I, want to ask, what I want you to do is, you don't need to look or do anything, but what do you think, where do you think the person sitting next to you is spiritually? Do you have a clue where they are spiritually? Let's go a little bit further. What about the person sitting in front of you? Do you know where they are spiritually? Are you in tune to where they are spiritually? Are you, are you, are you saying this? Now, now, let me make this real relevant. Many of us definitely knew where Hillary and Donald were, what they stood for, and where they were on issues. Amen, somebody? Amen, somebody? We, 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 we're really into it. Amen? What God is saying is, my people are supposed to be that in tune to the needs of my people. Are we there? It feels very uncomfortable up here today, but I got to do my job. You see what I'm saying? God is saying, you need to be in tune. You need to know what all the polls are saying. You need to understand. You need to be so in touch. You need to understand the church, the body of Christ that way, where you're worshiping. That's deep, isn't it? That's deep. And he's saying, that's what this word consider means. That I, I can come to a conclusion about where you are in, in your spiritual welfare, and I'm not judging you or anything negative, but this is what the church is supposed to be about. We're looking to everybody and anyone else to do that for us instead of the church. Amen? And so, he says, this is what I need you to do. Consider. And then consider what? How to stimulate one another. Oh my goodness. This is a word that is both negative and positive. Okay? Sometimes the word means irritation, getting on my last nerve, and producing pearls. Come from stimulation, sand, rubbing, and all that. Irritation. But see, it can be used positively. Now, most of us know how to fight. You know, we got the language, we got the, we got the, you know, we know how to provoke and we know how to handle our business that way. We know how to provoke people. We know how to start stuff. We know how to instigate. We know how to irritate, you know? Yeah, 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 we know how to do it. I know y'all don't do it now, but y'all haven't been saved since you were born, okay? We know how to do that stuff. Some of us know how to stir up people. You know, so-and-so said this and this. You know, we just look. I went to Cole and Mitchell. It was like, this. you imagine this whole church used to be running, watching people fighting on the street. And all of you were running, yeah, we're all, you know, and they're fighting. And who's going to get their clothes ripped off and their hair ripped out today? And we're all waiting for a fight after school. It was a good time. I guess it was better than going in the movies. We didn't have any movies in our neighborhood. You know, it was good as long as you weren't the one in the fight. When one of those big gangs come up on you and you're the one, it's a whole different story. Well, you know what, folks? We're exaggerating to make a point. This text is calling for you to do whatever is necessary to provoke and instigate another believer in the church, the body of Christ. But it's a good thing. And what are you to instigate and provoke them to? To love each other and good works. Are you seeing that? 
Somehow you can start something where you make somebody bad enough to go love somebody. You know, you make somebody mad enough in a sense that they're going to go do something good for somebody because they just want you to be quiet or stay out of my business or whatever the case may be. I'm going to get this done so you can just shut up about it. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you, are you following that? That's what we're talking about here. And so this is all done by the Spirit. We've got some prelims here. We're not telling you to go do something in your own strength. We're not telling you to go on a flesh trip, no. We're talking about you're spirit-filled, spirit-led, but God is saying you go over there and you kind of do whatever's necessary to provoke other people in the church, the body of Christ, to love each other and to do good works. This is what the Bible is calling encouragement. See, we've got all these definitions for encouragement. Some people need stimulation. And here's the sad thing, folks. Some of us, if we don't get this stimulation from the church, the body of Christ, we are going to stay in the exact same place we are now. And we're going to come around in the next election, four years from now, and we're going to be spiritually in the exact same place we are today. God is saying, we don't want that. That's not where we're trying to go. We want you to go on in this thing. You see, but sometimes you need a little stimulation. You need a little stimulation. I saw a movie one, I don't, um, don't remember the name of the movie, but this man was a, a billionaire and he left all this money to his grandson, but his grandson was lazy and just, you know, he's just got his old thing of what life should be about. They wanted to leave all these billions or millions to this grandson, so what the grandfather did in his will is he hooked him up with one of his partners down in Texas on a ranch. And he said, I want you to take my grandson down there and I want you to hook him up and get him right. So he goes on down there with his lazy self and he's sleeping in the bed and it's time to go put some fence posts in and all of that on the ranch. And he's going to do what he's been doing. This old cowboy went in there with one of those little electrical things you hit the cows with. And did it while he was sleeping in the bed. Hit him with that thing there. And that was like, got him going. You know, for some of us, if you don't hit us with one of those, we're not going nowhere. We need to say amen. Long as I'm comfortable staying the same and everything goes and don't nobody say anything, I'm going to stay here. It's working for me. It's a rut, but I'm comfortable in it. You ever heard that comfortable rut? Some of us stay in the same old mess. It's mess and we know it, but we stay there because it's our mess. At least we're comfortable with it. You need somebody to stimulate you. Get out of there. God's got more for you than this. Okay? And so we're talking about the church, the body of Christ here. And so he's saying here, we need to stimulate each other. Whatever it takes to get a little buzz in there, stimulate each other to love each other. And we're talking about agape love, where I think more of you than I do myself. Agape love is de love of devotion, not love of emotion. That I am devoted to you. I'm going to do what's best for you. I've got the right motives. It's not about me. It's about you. That's agape love, and only God can do that. So we got to be yielded to him for us to agape someone. Because otherwise, it's all about me. Even when I do something nice for you, it's really for me. It makes me feel good about me. Do you see? So he's saying here, no, 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 no. Consider each other, study them. And when you get them studied, how can you stimulate them to agape love and good deeds? To go do the right thing, to be what God would have us to be. Do you see this, folks? This is where we need to be. Love and good deeds. And understand, this is a way we encourage each other. Oh yeah, sometimes you need somebody to cry with you. Sometimes you need somebody to walk with you. Somebody, sometimes you need somebody to strengthen you, but sometimes you need somebody to stimulate you. Get on up there and become the best that you can become. You're better than this, so to speak. So we close out today, we close this series with one more verse, verse 25, and I'd like for you to read it together with me. Hebrews 10, 25, let's read it together. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's something very specific about encouraging each other. I hope this doesn't offend you. God has something called the church, the body of Christ, and he put it together that you're supposed to get together. You're supposed to come together. You're supposed to assemble together, congregate together. 
Uh, maybe here preaching a little bit, a little preaching together. Do some singing together, worship together. You have a gift. It's supposed to be exercised in the church, the body of Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? It's supposed to be exercised there. So when God's people come together, there should not be any needs because people are exercising their spiritual gifts. Okay? You're supposed to come together. Um, we, we have these things. This is the place. We're supposed to assemble together. It's supposed to be a time of encouragement. It's supposed to be a time of growth. This is what we're doing. This is the assembling. We call it going to church. Amen? We call it going to church. Now, before you get on the wrong place, if you study, you know, where uh, Don started in Romans 13, you study Romans 13, 14, and 15, you know, it's not a sin to miss church. Amen, it's okay. It's not a sin to miss church. Um, no, that's not, 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 not the way it is. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say something real radical. It's Bible. Go check what I told you, Romans 13, 14, 15. You don't even have to come to church on Sunday. Amen. It's Bible truth. It really is. If you decide you want to go to church on Saturday or Friday or Tuesday, you can go. What God says is you make up your mind when you're going to go, and then you be consistent. God is saying, don't come up here praying talking about you going to church on Tuesday and you did that in 2015 and I ain't seen you on a Tuesday since. Then when I confront you, well, I'm going to church on Wednesday. You don't show up on Wednesday either. God is saying, don't do that. But whatever day you decide you're going to go, you be there. And it's between you and him and he's good with it. You want to be around God's people. Okay, are we understanding that? So, you know, there's no sin in here if you miss church or something like that. I've told you, don't think I'm being blasphemous. I've had told some of these guys, especially some of the old timers, I want you to go fishing Sunday. Go fishing. You need to go fishing. And I know, and I got an understanding with these folks. You go fishing this Sunday. You didn't wore yourself out. And wore yourself out. You know? And there's others who've been fishing every Sunday for the last five years. And that's why that brother's wore out. Because he's doing their work and his. Are you following this, folks? Okay, so now we're talking about this whole assembling together. Now let me give you some history here. I said this book of Hebrews, and I'm wrapping up. You hang loose, I'm wrapping up. These were Jewish Christians who had come out of Judaism, the Mosaic Law and all of that, the temple worship and all of that. They were now into what we call Christianity. They were believing in Jesus Christ. At this point in history, they were called the way. Okay, you got to stay with me. We're, we're doing history here, and I'm not going to get way into it, but pun intended, we're, we're going to just get a little bit into it. They were called the way then. So these Jewish people now are hanging out with these people called the way who believe in Jesus Christ. It was not popular with the other Jewish people. It was not popular at all. So what happened was they started hanging around with the way the Jewish brothers they were in business with said, you, no, you, we can't have business together no more. Oh, you, uh, no, 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 you, you died. Families are saying, you died. We buried our son. He doesn't even exist anymore. He's over there with that way. No way. We're disowning you. We're disinheriting you. Stay away from us. Some of them started getting put in jail. Some of them talking about, you know, I sold you that house. I'm going to re, I'm going to take the house back, repossess the house. They started going through all kinds of things because they were following Jesus Christ. So the people of Jesus Christ were gathering together like we are today, but they were gathering in houses and they were doing the same things that we're doing. So what happened was these people would see these new Christians, so to speak, in these houses and it was getting hard to go to church like man every time i show up somebody starts to reject me or treat me bad so what they would do is they stopped coming to church they stopped coming to church yeah i'm saved but i'm staying home at bedside baptist but it wasn't that they were enjoying their freedom in christ it wasn't that they were going another day they did not like the heat they were getting for going to church. Are you grabbing it? And so he says here, don't forsake your assembling together. That was our context. Now listen, saints, listen to me. They were told to go to church. They were in danger for going to church. Church was causing them suffering, financial stress, all kinds of things, ulcers, everything else because they were going to church. And what is called is don't you forsake going to church because if you continue to keep yourself away from God's people, you're just gonna dry up and blow away. And eventually sin will deceive you again. And what does sin do? Let's go back to what we used to. Sin, let's go back to what we used to do. So let's go back to that. He said, no, don't go back. You got the right one, but you're gonna have to, you know, we'd say man up. 
And you're going to have to, by God's grace, and he'll give you this grace. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Appropriate that, and you go to church. Okay, can I get an amen? Because I'm getting ready to nail you now. And nobody's threatening you. You ain't lost your job. Nobody beat you up. Nobody's kicked you out of their family. Nobody has put a gun to your head and pulled the trigger. Nobody has put you where ISIS is. Y'all want to watch the video? We're going to slice these Christians' heads off in front of you. That ain't happening to you. And you're forsaking the assembling together of yourself? Why? Just because you want to. Saints, I call you out today. We don't know where we are in history. It, this isn't as bad as it's gotten. It might get worse, it might not. It's been worse before. But don't take what you can do freely for granted. For granted. Because the day may come where maybe they're going to be sitting outside watching to see who comes to church in here. And if we're not where we're going to be, if we see them, we're not coming to church. So you get to come and no, no gunfire, not a guilt trip. You don't have, did I tell you, it's not a sin to miss church. But don't forsake the assembling together. You get to come free, you know? You don't ever want to give a dollar. Nobody's going to send you a letter, write you up, put your giving on the wall. Or, you never heard anybody ask you for a dime in this church, have you? And we're talking 34 years. We don't, we, don't, we don't tithe people. We don't guilt trip people. We don't say somebody's going to come steal something. You got bad luck, bad marriage because you ain't giving. We don't do any of that. We don't put money on the stage and dance on it and say you're going to get this and get, and get Ron a new car and a new plane so we can have real church. You have never, ever heard that in this church from the day it began. So you come to church free. Nobody checks. I don't know what you give. You see what I'm saying? No, that ain't how we, we don't do anything like that. Don't take all that for granted. You see, that's wrong. That's wrong anyway. But you see my point. Don't take that for granted. You can come free. Don't forsake the assembling together. We're not putting you under law or guilt trip. Don't forsake the assembling together. And then get this, folks. A lot of us think that we can grow in the Lord and stuff on the mountaintop. What is that? I can go home, I can pray, I can read, I can do all that, and that's great. And I can really know how to love people all by myself. And I really can stimulate people all by myself. No, uh-uh. The test of your Christianity is when you get out here among the people. The test of our Christianity begins in our homes. That mountaintop, you're going to be a hermit and all that? No, that's not your test. Your test is when you're down here with real people. Everybody in here thinks they're real spiritual while they're by themselves. No, no, your spirituality is tested when you're among people. It's on Monday morning, and somebody that, you know, rubs you the wrong way. Can you agape them then? You know, your boss is on you, your boss doesn't like you, whatever it is. That's when it starts. You see, that, yeah, yeah, you can read your Bible and stuff. Yeah, no, but no, no, this is where it's lived out. This is where it's lived out, down here where we're living. We like this solo Christianity, and we're so spiritual all by ourselves. Yeah, anybody can be spiritual at home alone. No. You got to get out here where we're living. And, that, and you know what? And you got to get out here among God's people because when we're not walking in the Spirit, we're probably worse than the unsaved people. Huh? We are. It is. You got to get out here. You want to see what kind of Christian you are, you got to be among the people. So we got that, I'll just stay by myself and I'll be fine. All those godly people that do that all the time. No, your godliness is tested in the trenches, not in the foxhole all by yourself. Okay? So it says some of them have had, made this a habit. So encourage each other. Encourage each other. This is about encouragement, and we're closing. All the more as you see the day drawing near. I know you've been looking around. You thinking this might be the end of things, some of us? It can be, you know, this is like, this has got to be the end. I mean, every civilization has been destroyed when homosexuality comes to the forefront. Well, we got all kinds of stuff going on. You, you see what I'm saying? 
We now have sex changes that are paid for by our government in the Army. Got that in print. That just came out. We got all kinds of stuff going on. Do you ever think this might be it for us? Uh, when you look at Putin, what's his name? Putin? Not Putin, Putin. You look at all this, maybe you're thinking this thing might be in. Maybe is Christ coming back? I don't know. Uh, the rapture, there's no signs of it. The second coming, it, it is going to be a part where everybody turns against Israel and Christ is coming back. The, the two are not the same. Hope you got that. What are you thinking? Well, I don't know. You just live long enough. It's got to be closer, just on logic, right? If I'm still living today, the end of things is closer than it was yesterday. And here's what it's saying. The closer it gets, the worse you see things looking, the more you need to be assembled with God's people. Because you're going to need encouragement. You're going to need encouragement to live right on your job. You're going to need encouragement when it comes to whatever you're doing in your personal life. You're going to need encouragement today to marry someone of the opposite sex. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're going to need encouragement today for that. Are you, are you grasping it? So that's what the body is for. So don't forsake it. You're cutting your own throat. Amen? And please, I'm closing. You're at Berean Bible Church today. I want everybody in here to hear me very carefully. And this is not a guilt trip from the pastor that you come to this church. I want you to go wherever you feel comfortable. If it fits you like a suit, you be there. And you be there before God. You and him know when you're going, how often you're going, and why you're going. The main thing is don't forsake the assembling together. The church, the body of Christ is all over the world. You just make sure you're not forsaking assembling. You don't have to come here. This church isn't everybody's cup of tea. We got a blue rug and no parking lot. And it ain't nothing wrong with blue rugs, don't you get me wrong. But somebody gonna walk in and leave out of here because the rug is blue. And I've seen them leave because we don't have a parking lot. I've had them call. You don't have a parking lot, can't come. Do you see? That's where we are today. But you make sure you don't forsake assembling together. Okay? Are you getting, you're getting it? No guilt trips. Nothing like that today. No, no, none. We don't want to ever do that. But make sure you're understanding. You need to assemble somewhere. All right, so the series is closed. This is all by God's grace. You gotta make some choices. We're to encourage each other. Encourage, me, encourage means to strengthen each other, to warn each other, to stimulate each other. What are we talking about? We wanna do that encouragement for folks to know God, keep their proper perspectives right, and encourage the body of Christ, amen? We wanna make good use of today for encouraging each other. Don't put it off, do it today. And don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't let sin deceive you that way. Don't let it do it. And then let's provoke the body however we need to, to love each other and to do good works. And then the final thing is, church, the body of Christ, you all are saints if you're saved. That's your title. That's your name. We got to stick together. Stick together. And don't let stuff come in between us. Don't let stuff divide us. Don't let our race divide us. Don't let our politics divide us. Don't let us Republicans and Democrats and independents divide us. None of that. We're the church, the body of Christ. We're that first. And we need to live like that. We need to live like that. Let everybody else do all that other stuff. We're the church, the body of Christ. And we're not some people hiding out in the mountains and doing weird stuff or nothing, but we're supposed to be taking care of each other. We take care of each other. You use your gift, we're all taken care of. Amen? And for those of you who didn't know it, there's a gift of giving too. And what that is, not to do with the church, that is somebody that God has blessed that they want to give and meet your needs and they're a church to the body of Christ. And they're supposed to be using their gift to meet the needs of the church to the body of Christ. So the church to the body of Christ is not supposed to have any needs whatsoever as long as everybody's using their gift. Are you using yours? Are you showing up? somewhere amen and i thank you and praise you all for showing up today because i know we had a bronco game at 11 o'clock okay let's stick together let's close in prayer father thank you for this series and uh, it has come to a conclusion for today anyway 
And Father, we do pray that we will continue to encourage each other and be there for each other and really be the church, the body of Christ. Please help us to focus on you, where we're from, why we're here, and that this is a temporary stay and our long stay is with you in eternity, Father. And we just pray that we'll get it all settled in our brains and our minds. And Father, we pray that we're not coming up in here trying to go heaven by and by either. You have reigning in life, victory in life, relationship in life. And then death is graduation to an even better relationship. So Father, you're for us all the way around. You're a good, good father. Please deliver saints from thinking that it's going to only get better when they die. No, no, no. It's better now. But we've got to do things your way. So thank you for everything. May we really encourage each other. May we really be the church, the body of Christ. And we're trusting you on that, Father. And thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.